I put the Korean version. Uh, I have a book in Korean, and I'd love any of you great scholars to read it, a little bit of it, and see if it's really about the family. And so, because uh, I've never read it. I don't read Korean. And also, I put all the slides and notes up for you, so those are there. Um, I want to um, emphasize more than I did yesterday that while you're in Bible school, you need to cultivate your skills in biblical interpretation. Now, biblical interpretation is what God means by what he says in the Bible. Most cults, most false religious groups that are underneath Christianity take verses and twist them. Uh, for example, there are uh, all types of um, different legalistic groups that, uh, like the Seventh-day Adventists that say you can't eat pork and you, you have to go to church on Saturday. And what they do is they, they take a portion of the scripture and they overlook other portions. They take things basically out of context. And so um, interpretation is the theological uh, division called hermeneutics. And so um, the first canon or the first law of textual interpretation is, now, now think about this, what did God mean when he spoke to the original recipients of that portion of scripture? See, that's so important to understand. God did not write primarily the Bible to Lydia. Secondarily, he wrote it to us. Primarily, what we're studying today in Revelation, Jesus had John write that for some people that were alive at that very moment. Understanding what they heard and how they understood what Jesus said is the key to interpreting the Bible. That's what we call context. So that's the primary interpretation. Thus, the historical context, the geographical context, the scriptural context is vital. And when you combine that with the grammar, see, the Bible was written very precisely. In fact, the Greek language is so precise that an event, you can tell whether it happened one time in the past and never happened again, or it happened in the past and continued and ended, or it happened in the past and it came till now, or it happened and it's still going. That's how, I mean, Greek language, the time expressions within the verbs are so advanced. Now Hebrew is completely different. Hebrew is oriental. It's like all of you that uh, are oriental language people, Hebrew is oriental, it's pictorial, it's pictorial uh, kind of, all the letters of the alphabet are, are basically groupings and all of them, words that start with those letters, are in those groups. And so it's a very picturesque language. Greek is not that way. Greek is Western, Occidental. So um, to interpret the Bible correctly or if you continue uh, and go into theology to understand hermeneutics, you understand the scriptural context, where it is in the Bible, the historical context where it is, in other words, in the span of biblical redemptive history, the grammar uh, or the uh, grammatical um, context is what, whether it's a command, whether it's, it's something that is in the past and whether it's continuing. So to do that this morning, uh, we're in the book of Revelation. We're in the first part of the book of Revelation, the part that's written to the church. We are looking at something Jesus did. Jesus came back to the church in the second generation, walks around unseen. Isn't that interesting to think? Jesus walked around unseen. You know all the stuff that's on the internet about uh, uh, people that like the cameras, those red light cameras, uh, that the government's watching them. And my son actually got a ticket in the mail that showed him driving, had a picture of his back license plate, and I had another picture showing him coming through the intersection and the light above him is red. So they had three different pictures of him and they mailed it to him with a bill. He didn't know that he even did that. I mean, he didn't even remember that he went through a red light. But in Denver, Colorado, in the United States, they have enough cameras to have the back of your car, a close-up of your face, and then a 
kind of a pulled out view that shows your car, your face, the light, and you going through. Now think of this. That's unseen watching. Jesus walked through each of the churches. He looked at each member. He looked at the pastor. He looked at the, the motivations of their hearts. And he writes this, this letter that we're reading right now. Now, basically, um, you guys have been... Do you go to Turkey? You only go to Israel. You don't go to Greece? I mean, on your trips. Okay. So this is Greece, Europe over here. Uh, those of you that... Who is this from Turkey? Ah, uh, Lydia. So you live on the Byzantium side or over on the... This side, but... You go on both sides. You see where Byzantium is right up there at the top? That's where uh, Istanbul is, and that's where the west meets the east. That's the, the convergence of Europe and, and basically Asia. But look right here is what, what we're talking about. Ephesus right here, that's a seaport city, Smyrna. And then you go over to Sardis, Thyatira, Pergamos, Philadelphia, Laodicea. Those seven churches are all in that uh, western part of Greece. Here's another way to look at it. Uh, basically, this is the direction the postal route went. You know, the Roman Empire had mail, just like we, well, they don't have mail. Everything's electronic now. But it used to be a person carried letters and put it at everybody's house in a little box. <coughs> Excuse me. So the mail would go from Ephesus following the, the valleys. See, even though it looks like all those cities are close to each other, there are mountains and other obstacles. So to get to them, you followed the river valleys. And so you would follow Ephesus to Smyrna, up to Pergamos, down to Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea. That's actually, in the Roman Empire, the postal route. That's why the letters are in that order. That's how they were delivered. And that's how people would travel. Now, if you notice, look how close Colossae is to Laodicea. Do you see the Colossae and Laodicea? They were, they were uh, very close biblical towns. So this morning we're still in Pergamos. Uh, the reason we're in Pergamos, I have to finish this, because Pergamos is where we trace the origin of the Roman Catholic Church. Now this, I'm not teaching church history, but I want to show you something. Have you ever, all of you have seen Roman Catholic churches, right? Do they have them here in Korea? Yes or no? No, they're just Presbyterian churches. No Roman Catholic churches. Do all of you know what Roman Catholic is? Anybody not know what Roman Catholic is? The Pope, you know, the, the Pope, the guy in Rome, the head of the Catholic Church. Where did that come from? Have you ever thought about that? They have the same Bible. They have the same language. In fact, 90 some percent of Roman Catholicism is exactly what we believe. They believe in the deity of Jesus Christ, they believe in the Trinity, they believe in the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So why aren't they the same as us? Well, something happened. Basically, on the left here is a chart that I teach in church history class, when I teach church history. The original church that Jesus Christ started basically uh, was just one big gigantic church all over the place until the Roman Catholic Church started declaring doctrines that weren't in the Bible. The first one was purgatory. The second one was papal power. The third one was the Mass, where they said that people, if you partake of the Mass, that's Roman Catholic communion, that, that it gives you grace every time you take it and is a part of salvation. And so, that deviation, this kind of line going this way, went further and further from the truth of the Bible. So in 1517, we have what's called the Reformation, Martin Luther, who was a Roman Catholic priest, who said, no, this is absolutely not right with the Bible. And that's the, the, uh, the strategic point. Now, remember, Judaism, that's Old Testament, um, scriptures for the Jews, uh, was what Jesus was a part of. He was a Jew, brought up in Judaism, but what he did is he said, all of that was just a schoolmaster to bring you to me, and he took it, fulfilled it, and started 
what we would call the one holy, and the word Catholic, by the way, means universal. It doesn't mean denomination, it means universal. Apostolic, remember he said that the church would be built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, church. So Jesus started the church. But look where we are now. Let's, in fact, there's Presbyterian up there. Aren't a lot of you from Korea from Presbyterian backgrounds? Korea is Presbyterian. Look, Presbyterian really is, is part of the, the Catholic Church started splitting off into all these different groups. Uh, basically, these over here were more evangelical like we are. These over here were more liturgical like the Catholics were. The Reformed Church, as in Martin Luther and then John Knox, went off into the Presbyterians. The Anglican Church, which is English Catholic, went into the Methodist and uh, a lot of those others. So I just want you to see that. But the question is, what, what happened in Pergamum with this doctrine of Balaam? So everybody go back in your Bibles to Revelation 2. I just want to point out one thing in, in, uh, about Pergamus that I want you to see why I'm even spending all this time talking about it. In chapter 2, starting in verse 12, it says, to the church of Pergamos, write, and he gives all those commendations, and then he says, look at this in verse 14, I have a few things against you because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put stumbling blocks before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. Do you all remember the story of Balaam? The talking donkey, remember the angel? Balaam was hired by Balak, the king of the Moabites, to, to curse Israel. So he goes up on a mountain, he builds all these altars, they're on this mountain, they're looking down in the valley, you can see the three million Jews in their tents moving around. It must look like ants down there. They were just all moving around in their tents. Here they are up in this high mountain with these seven altars and they're burning, uh, sacrificing animals, and Balaam, who, by the way, is kind of like a witch doctor, is what he was. He was a, a, a medium. He was a communicator with spirits. He was hired to curse. And he tries to, and he can't. Instead, God takes over what he said, and he actually speaks part of the Bible. It's amazing. This is Numbers 22 to 24. It's amazing what happens. And so he tries again, and he can't. And so they won't pay him, and they send him away. And if you remember, the angel, you know, the sword and all that, uh, and the donkey says, why are you beating me? It's really a fun part of the Bible to read. All of a sudden, we find the next chapter that God kills 24,000 Jews in the camp. God kills his own people. What happened? All of a sudden, when you read the rest of the story, Balaam couldn't curse him. So he went to, the, to Balak and said, you know what? The best way to get Israel is get them to compromise and allow sin to come into that camp, and God will kill them for you. Because God doesn't let his people live in sin. And so Balaam became representative of compromise. What he did is he told if you all are the camp of Israel, and here are the Moabites over here who are not in the camp of Israel, right next to the border of Israel, they set up their shrine. Now, all of these ancient religions involved sex in some form. They all had sexual sides to them, fertility it's called. In other words, if you go to the temple and you involve yourself in sexual relations with the priest or priestess, God will bless your crops, God will bless you to have children and all this. Total immorality, it's total um, wickedness. But it's very alluring if you're in your camp. See, Israel was kind of like word of life. You couldn't be on the internet except certain times and everything was filtered and blocked and Israel was quite isolated from worldliness. So right here, within sight, they started having the Moabite girls undress and walk around. Well, all the Israelite boys were going, you know, they'd never seen that before. And so they started sneaking out of camp 
getting the Moabite girls and taking them home. And that caused God to kill 24,000, a plague broke out. And you know, if you've read the story, Phinehas, the, the, the priest took a spear and he walked right into the tent where the Jewish boy was carrying on with the Moabite girl and he stuck the spear through both of them into the ground, kind of like skewered them like an olive on a toothpick. And at that instant as he did that, the plague stopped. But it had come through the camp and killed 24,000 people. People were just dropping like flies. It was just amazing. So that's what Balaam did. Now you say, so on page 130 in your notes, I explain this. Historically, what happened is something's going on. In the Old Testament, God warned in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 44, he warned about a false teaching that was going on in the paganism of the Canaanites. The Canaanites are the original inhabitants in the land of Israel. And, and God's people came in, was supposed to kill all of them. They really were. They were supposed to exterminate all the Canaanites. But they didn't want to. They kept them and said, you will cut our wood, and you will bring our water to our house, and you'll cook for us, and you'll wash our clothes. All these people brought their false religion. Part of what they worshipped is the queen of heaven. It actually says that. You ought to read Jeremiah 44. It calls this goddess the queen of heaven. Do you know what the Roman Catholic Church calls Mary? Guess. The queen of heaven. In fact, the Roman Catholic Church presents Jesus as a little baby and Mary is holding him. And if you want anything, you've got to come to her and he talks to him for you. In other words, Mary becomes the go-between between between God the Father and Jesus and you. That concept is from this, uh, Semiramis was her name, and basically, and I will just tell you the short of it, since you don't know much about Catholic uh, doctrine, it's fascinating. There's something, um, isn't Easter, when is Easter? Of April. So right now, we are in what's called Lent. Has anybody ever heard of Lent? How many of you have heard of Lent? Okay, so you know what I'm talking about. Lent, sorry, I just unplugged the speaker. Lent is 40 days that lead up to Easter. Okay, where's that in the Bible? Where does it say that you have Ash Wednesday and uh, Monday, Thursday, and you have Lent. Where does it say that in the Bible? It doesn't say that in the Bible. Where did it come from? What is this 40-day period that actually uh, starts with Mardi Gras? That's a big festival. Don't they have that in, uh, they have that in um, Brazil. You know, the whole, what do they call that thing? Carnival, carne, carne which is meat, carnival, uh, the giving out of meat. But all, where did all this stuff come from that's in Catholicism? It comes from Semiramis. And here's the short of it. Semiramis, who is also known as Ashtoreth, who is also known as you know, Isis and Serapsis. In all of the ancient religions, there is a mother and a son. In Hinduism, in Egyptian, uh, religion, in Persian religion, in Canaanite religion, in Roman and Greek religion. They all have a mother-son deal going on. All of them have a son who gets killed, who dies. This one is fascinating. Semiramis' son Tammuz is killed while he's hunting. A wild bull or, or boar comes and puts its tusk in him and tears him up. And she goes out and finds him in pieces. So she puts him in a basket and mourns for him for 40 days. His body's in the basket. And on the 40th day, he comes out of the basket after 40 days. Now, did that happen? Absolutely not. But that pagan worship of the Queen of Heaven is what they did in Canaan. They moved it 
to Pergamus, the headquarters for it, and have you ever heard of Julius Caesar, you know, the founder of the Roman Empire? He moved that worship to Rome, and he became the chief priest of this religion of Semiramis, the queen of heaven, and all that. And this concept of Tammuz dying, being mourned for 40 days, and rising on the 40th day was brought right into the Catholic Church. Now, how did that happen? Well, Constantine, you ever hear of him? He was a Roman emperor who was a pagan, and he was fighting Maximius, and they met at the Milvian Bridge. His armies were here, and uh, Max, Maxentius's army was there, and there was a bridge between them. And he was in his tents, and he said, boy, I need help. His army's bigger than mine. He had heard of Christianity, and he said, God, if you'll help me, I will, I will honor you. And so if you help me, I'm going to put on every one of my Roman legionnaire shields a cross. So he's a pagan. He's not a Christian. He made a deal with God, painted a cross on all of his Roman legionnaires' shields, and they won the battle. It was a turning point in the Roman Empire. Constantine won. So do you know what he did in A.D. 313? He said, we're not going to kill any more Christians. Do you remember I told you yesterday that Diocletian had the most complete extinction event? He killed every pastor, destroyed every church, ruined every Bible, complete Bible. That's in 305. 305. Look, eight years later, Christianity is at the closest point of extinction ever. Constantine says, you're legal. He made a decree. He said, Christianity is now the religion of the empire. But he had a real problem. You know what his problem was? All of this paganism, Rome had conquered all of the known world. And basically, they had this, they had this program that was called Pantheon. In fact, you ever heard of that building? Anybody ever heard of the Pantheon? That's a building in Rome. Pan means all. Theon means gods. So it all gods. So what Rome did is every, every country, every group of people they conquered, they conquered them, but they took their god and brought it, you know, their little idol or whatever it was, and brought it back and put it in this building. The Pantheon kind of looks like that and it had a rotunda, and all the way around the rotunda on the inside. They just had all these statues. And so you were from, you know, whatever city, Pergamos, and you came to Rome, there's your God, right there on the shelf, everything's okay. I'll be a Roman because my God is there. My whatever I worship is there. That was Rome's religion. And all of a sudden, Constantine added this. So there were thousands and thousands and thousands of priests of all these different religions, plus Christianity. Have you ever wondered where all the beads, the rosary beads, the candles, all those clothes, the Roman Catholic, you ever seen what Roman Catholic priests wear? The mitres and all these headdresses, every one of those things come from the paganism of all the Roman Empire that was merged in 313 by Constantine. And so basically, I wrote in your notes seven reasons why I'm not a Roman Catholic. The first one is Mass. Do you know what Mass is? They crucified Jesus over again. Every time a Catholic church has Mass, they are re-nailing Jesus to the cross. That's what Mass is. They crucify him at every Mass. Do you know how many times Jesus has been crucified in the Catholic Church? Sometimes 7, 10, 12 times a day in each cathedral. Every day for the last 2,000 years. By the way, Hebrews 10 says, how many times was Jesus offered on the cross? The Catholic Church says, endlessly. Jesus said, once. So the Mass is absolutely, there's... Just for the Mass, no one should be in the Roman Catholic Church. That is the most blasphemous error possible. But then, Mary. 
Mary's holding Jesus. You want to get to Jesus? Mary's holding him. You've got to come to her first. Mary is venerated. Did you know a Roman Catholic, if we had a true Roman Catholic in this room, they would call out to Mary right here. Now let me ask you this. How could Mary hear them? Is Mary in this room? No. Is she in Korea? No. Is she on earth? No. How can Mary hear you pray to her if she is omnipresent? You ever heard that word, omnipresent? How about omniscient, knowing everything? How about omnipotent, able to help you? Do you know what the Catholics do? They ascribe to Mary the attributes of God, that she can hear anyone, help anyone, and be with anyone. That's terrible. Then you add to that their tradition, the traditions of the Catholic Church. Here are the traditions of the Church. Here's the Bible. They elevate them over the Bible. So that's totally wrong. They, they venerate images. They don't worship them. They bow down to them. They pray to them. They wear them. They put them in their house. And they venerate them. They don't worship them. They do worship them. But they call it veneration. That's wrong. Sacraments. They say that a Roman Catholic, you have to be baptized, and then after you're baptized, you have to be confirmed, and then after you're confirmed, you have to go to confessions, and then you have to do penance, and then you have to take the sacrament of marriage or the sacrament of holy orders. That means either you get married or you join the church, and then before you die, you have to have extreme unction. Do you know what they make Christianity? Like an IV. Do you know what an IV is? It's one of those bags with liquid in it and a little line, and they poke it in your arm, and it's going drip, drip, drip. The Catholic Church hooks people up to a bag of grace called sacraments, and they drip in a drip at your baptism, a drip at your confirmation, a drip at your confessions. Every time you go to Mass, you get another drip. Uh, when you do penance, when you get married, you get a drip, but you haven't got enough drips, so you've got to get some more drips at extreme unction. And even after all that, where do you go when you die? Purgatory. Did you know that? Jesus did not die on the cross with enough power to get you to heaven, even after all that. You have to go and be purged. You know what purgatory is? It's like burning off all the bad stuff you still have. Is that Christianity I just described? Any of that? Where did it come from? It came from paganism. Everything I told you is part of paganism, including purgatory. Purgatory is not in the Bible. Purgatory is in a Greek um, letter added to the Bible called the Apocrypha. It's in 2 Maccabees chapter 24. And it says you should pray for people to get them out of the fires. And the Catholic Church added that. So very dangerous. Okay. Now let's go to the next church. Uh, we're going to go to Thyatira. Thyatira is, is revealing to us how when Jesus walked around, he searches our hearts and minds, and that's in Revelation 2. So let's read the letter. You guys follow along. Notice it's the same format. To the angel, the messenger of the church in Thyatira write, these things says the Son of God. Now look at this. Who has eyes like a flame of fire. Do you remember in chapter 1? When we saw Jesus with the white hair and the face like sun, it says his eyes were like a flame of fire. Each of these letters, Jesus pulls out an element from that original picture, and he repeats it. His eyes are like a flame of fire, which means I can see, and his feet are like fine brass. And brass in the Bible speaks of judgment. Remember the, the brazen altar is where God judged sin. That's why it was brazen, not golden. Uh, then comes the commendation. Now, you know what's interesting? All these churches, no matter how bad they are, Jesus can find something good. You remember Felipe's uh, chapel message about how encouraging, how Barnabas was encouraging? Jesus is encouraging. No matter how bad the church was, he could find something good that he could say about them. And this is what he says. I know your works. That means they were saved. They, were, they had salvation because we were saved for good works, not by good works, to produce good works. If you're saved... God living in us does something that's called good works. It's a transformed life. I know your works, 
your charity or love, your service, your faith, your patience, your works. He, he doubles it. And the last to be more than the first. Did you catch that? He says, you guys, you're actually working harder for me than you used to. Then he says, notwithstanding I have a few things against thee, because you suffer a woman, Jezebel, which calls herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants, to commit fornication. This was a false teacher who was leading the people into sin. Now I'll explain to you how it ties into their city in a minute. To eat things sacrificed to idols, that's the Balaam thing, and to give her space to repent of her fornication, she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed. So this is not a figurative. He isn't just saying false teachings like Jezebel. This is a person that was actually doing something bad because Jesus said, I will cast her into a bed. Now, what is this? And them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds, and I will kill her children with death, and all the churches will know that I am he who searches the reins and the hearts. He's looking on the inside. And I will give to every one of you according to your works. Do you know, yesterday I gave you this verse, Galatians 6, 7 and 8, remember? Be not deceived, God is not mock, whatever you sow, that you'll reap. I will give every one of you according to your works. Jesus said, I'm watching your life. You can't hide sin from me. Uh, I will recompense. But unto you, I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine. See, there was, not everybody in the church was following Jezebel, which have not known the depths of Satan, as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden but that which you already have. Hold fast till I come. So that's the exhortation. Now the promise to the true believers. Remember, overcomer is just another name for a true believer. 1 John 5 tells us. And keep it, he that overcometh and keepeth my works to the end. That's called the perseverance of the saints. That people that believe in Christ never stop believing all the way to the end. The Lord is able to keep them, as it says in Jude. Him I will give power over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. Well, what's that talking about? That's Psalm 2. Jesus says that you're going to live and reign with me during what we call the millennium. He says, you're, if you are faithful right now in life and, and resist temptation and sin and, and repent and follow me, you're going to reign with me. Wow, big promise. And... Um, even as I received my father, I will give him the morning star. Wow. And then look, every one of them has this. He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says. Okay, number one, God sent more New Testament letters. Do you see that in your notes? Here than anywhere else. This church and the area around it got this letter in Revelation. They got Peter's two epistles, uh, uh, you know, 1 Peter and 2 Peter. The book of Galatians was written to this area. The book of Ephesians was written to this area. The book of Colossians was written. Timothy, first and second, was written to this area. And all three of John's epistles, plus James. Did you know 12 books of the Bible were written to where these seven churches are? No other part of the world got so many letters. But they had to make a choice. They had all these books of the Bible. They had all these teachers. They had to choose something. Now let me just tell you a little bit about Thyatira. When they excavated Thyatira, it was the trade guild center of the Roman Empire. A trade guild is like a union. My father worked for General Motors, building cars. He was in the UAW, the United Auto Workers Union. They've had unions where you collectively work together to get more wages and you go on strike and all that. Those are not new. Those are ancient. Thyatira was the union trade guild head. And basically, to keep the workers happy, the way they worked it is you would come to a monthly luncheon. You would, and by the way, uh, William Ramsey, the great British archaeologist excavated this uh, area. William Ramsay. He was an archaeologist. And he said 
that living in Thyatira was almost impossible to do as a Christian. He said the banquets in Thyatira for the working men, monthly, they would lay on couches. So this table would be like a couch, and you would lay on it like this on one arm with your head toward the middle, and you would be served as much food as you wanted, and you would be served as much wine as you wanted, but you were served the food and the wine by slave girls that were kind of like, I don't know, in Japan, are geisha girls positive or negative? Are they kind of like, I think they used to be bad, weren't they? Like girlfriends of the workers or something? I don't know. But, but these servants were prostitutes, okay? Can you imagine going to a dinner as a man, laying on a couch, drinking alcohol endlessly, served by a woman who was a prostitute whose goal was to get you to go out of the room with her? That's what life was like in Thyatira. Sin was everywhere present. It was a part of work. You told your wife, I got to go to lunch today, and you couldn't wait to go to lunch because every month you had those women that would do anything. Now, can you imagine being a Christian? Growing up in a Christian home, your parents say, you know what, God says you're supposed to wait. No sex till you're married. God designed sex. It's like a river. It's wonderful, but keep it in the banks of marriage. And you go to work, and this woman is serving you endless rounds of alcohol, sitting on your couch and saying, I'm here for you. What would you like? That's what everyday life was like here. Do you understand? You think you have struggles? How would you like to have that be your normal everyday life? It's, it's terrible. One, one writer from this period said it was like living in a cesspool. That's like a septic tank. That's like a toilet of sin. But Christ's call to holiness has never changed. And basically what Jesus said is the, the solution to, to sin is to realize what the scriptures tell us that because of the past event of Jesus Christ's death on the cross, the justifying death of Christ, basically, Jesus in the past died for my sins so that I can live the sanctifying life of Christ. Do you know what sanctifying means? I can say no to sin. How do I say no to sin? John 8, 32 says, whom the Son will set free will be free indeed. Jesus said, I have come to set you free. You just have to believe that. He said, you can, you can be like Joseph. Do you remember Joseph in the Old Testament? Do you remember Potiphar's wife? She comes to him in a room all alone, and she starts undressing him. She starts taking his clothes off. What did he say? It's the most profound statement in the Bible. He looked at her and he said, how can I do this evil and sin against what? God. Do you know what Potiphar's wife did? She went, where's God? I don't see any God. I just see you and I'm undressing you. Who else is in this room? Joseph was so conscious God was in the room with him that he couldn't give in to sin. That's what living in the present based on the past. When we met Jesus Christ, we're never alone. We're never alone in the room with anybody. He's with us. That's living in the present based on the past that I have been crucified with Christ. He did die in my place. He did give me a new heart. I don't have to give in to sin. What happens when we do? Well, starting on page 146, I can't go through this with you, but I wrote it out for you. And any of you that are going to uh, be uh, eager beavers, there's a lot to learn there. Samson is one of the most beautiful pictures of what happens to a believer that gives in to sin, okay? And so basically, uh, Samson shows us what 1 Corinthians 3.15 says. So look in your Bible at 1 Corinthians. I wanna show you what Paul taught these people, and maybe you've never seen this before. You know one thing I love about teaching at Word of Life? I show people verses some of them have never seen before. 1 Corinthians 3.15, right there, says this. It starts actually in, in verse 13, everyone's work will become clear, 
the day will declare it, it will be revealed by fire, the fire will test everyone's works of what sort it is. If anyone's work he has built on endures, he will receive a reward. So this is, 1 Corinthians 3 is about rewards for Christians, okay? Now look at what it says in verse 15. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he will be saved. Did you know that our lives are going to be tested by fire? And God's going to let us see what our life looks like after it goes through the fire. Samson suffered loss, it says in the Bible. Verse 15, believers today will suffer loss. They will be saved, verse 15 says, yet so as through fire. What did Samson do wrong? Number one, in Judges 13, he wandered away from his godly heritage. His mom and dad said, you're not supposed to date Philistine girls, unsaved girls. He said, I don't care, I want to, they're prettier. Samson disobeyed his parents. He snuck out of the house and finds a Philistine girl. Samson compromised his life. He doesn't marry her, he lives with her. He starts committing sin with her. He ignores God's warnings. Do you remember that, that, um, that Delilah starts you know, putting his hair in this loom? You know? She's trying to figure out where his strength comes from, and she actually takes his hair and weaves it into a carpet. And he's so strong, he jumps up and breaks the loom and finds this, the Philistine army men coming at him and, and kills him. But he, God was warning him not to mess around with Delilah. He played with sin. And finally, his compromises led to disaster. Do you remember what happened to him? They gouged his eyes out, and they made him be like an animal uh, pushing a mill around and grinding. Instead of a donkey doing it, they made him do it. So first they bound him, then they blinded him, and then they made him grind the grain. Now, what did the Lord say to the church here in Thyatira? Some of you are dead and some of you are sick and sleeping. See, God doesn't tolerate sin. And in the Thyatira church, he said, just like Samson, I'm not gonna let you. Because God is a God of new beginnings. And uh, uh, sometime this week or next week, I'm gonna tell you about Douglas, but I can't today. Uh, he's one of the most amazing trophies of grace I've ever gotten to lead to the Lord. Here we go, let's go to the next church. Uh, we have six minutes to get through Sardis. This is, remember I told you Sardis was a literal geographic place. The city was up there on that high uh, hill, had big walls. That's the Acropolis. And you notice what Jesus says when we read it in uh, Revelation 3.3. He says, behold, I'll come like a thief in the night. That's how this city was conquered. One of the soldiers was sitting up on guard on the wall and he was messing around and he tipped his head forward and his helmet fell off. His helmet fell off from up there. And it went boom, 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 and fell all the way to the bottom. So you know what he did? He jumped over the wall and took the footholds and, and there was actually this hidden steps that went all the way down the wall. You couldn't see from a distance, they were just little niches put into the wall. And he went boop, 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 boop. Went down, got his helmet, went boop, 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 went up to the top. Well, the armies, the enemies, always had people watching the city looking for weaknesses. And when they saw that, they realized the way into the city was up the wall. And this city was conquered in the night because they didn't even guard it at night because they figured nobody can get in here. The walls are so high and the cliffs are so high. And so Jesus uses a reference to that to remind us about something. Um, basically, Sardis, my synopsis is, is where Jesus, the great physician, felt their pulse and declared them dead. Watch what I mean. It's right here in, this, in the reading. So here, here we go. This is Revelation 3, 1 and 2. To the angel, the messenger of the church in Sardis, and then we have the title of Christ. These things says he that has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. His concern, I know your works. You have a name that you're alive, that you livest. But look what he says. You are dead. Revelation 2 and 3 is Jesus coming around like a doctor checking the health of the church. 
He's seeing if they're healthy, if they're doing what he asked them to do. He reaches down and touches the wrist of the church in Sardis and he says, you don't even have a heartbeat. You, you aren't at all acting like believers. Be watchful, his exhortation, strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found your works perfect before God. He says, yep, you're saved, but you're not at all pleasing to me right now. Remember how you've received and heard and hold fast and repent. Therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come as a thief. See, that like when the city was conquered, Sardis was conquered by their enemies, and you will not know what hour I come upon thee. But you have a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. And then this promise to true believers, he that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment. I will not blot his name out of the book of life. Oh, ho, 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 boy, people are afraid of that verse. That's the verse where, where people believe you can lose your salvation. Doesn't it sound like it? Look at what it says. I will not blot your name out. So what people say is, some people, he does blot their name out. That's not what it says. Actually, this is one of the greatest promises there is. Jesus said, I will never blot your name out of the book of life because you belong to me. This is an affirmation that you can't lose your salvation because he doesn't say, I will. He says, I will not blot your name out of the book of life, but I will confess your name. You know what? The moment, probably since I'm almost the oldest and weakest person here, I'll probably die before all of you. Do you know what happens at the instant of our death? To absent from the body, we're present with the Lord. What does the Lord do with us? As soon as we die, Jesus comes, meets us, takes us home. Look what it says. I will confess your name before my Father and his angels. He leads us up in heaven past all the angels, marshaled angels, lining the streets, right up to the throne of God, and says, Father, this is one of my children that I died for on the cross. This is one of those I paid for. And I am going to introduce you. I will confess his name. Do you remember earlier in one of these letters, it says, I'll give you a new name that no one knows except my father and I know? That's when he introduces us to God as this unique person that are part of his family forever. Wow, that's, can't wait till I have that event and till you have that event. And then he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is what uh, Sardis looks like today. See up there, there's the Acropolis and here are the columns. Um, there's a verse Jesus said that is haunting Jesus said, why do you call me Lord and obey me not? Isaiah 29, 13 says, this people comes near to me with their mouth, but their heart is far from me. That's what was going on there. And when we come back from the break, we'll finish up Sardis. Have a great break.